Okay, welcome to Art and Up. I'm Melanie Karas Moniotis. I'm Christine Ballard. And this is the place where creatives connect, cultivate, and support each other's artistic journey. Absolutely. Now, Jane, thank you for, for being with us today. Welcome. And we have a of questions for you. We're going to pick your brain. The first thing we want to know is when did you know you wanted to be an artist? It was one of those weird things where I just thought everyone could draw. And when I was nine or 10, everyone always asked me to draw things for them. And I kind of said, why don't you just do it for yourself? I was always playing with pencils and pens and everything else. And, and it was just something I always did. My, my, my present when I was seven was a set of 72 Derwent pencils. And it was just <gasps> wonderful. 72. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got them. <laughs> and so it's been something that I've just always done. And I think when I was in about oh year year nine at school or year ten, I don't know. It, it's it was just always who I was. But I, I, it was sort of about year six, I think, when I was at school that I realised it wasn't something that everyone did. That some people um, could draw and some people couldn't. That it was a bit of a surprise. So going through school, I did art right through school. I went on and did a fine arts degree, and. It was almost a sort of a case of whether I did music or art, but really art was art was where I was most happy. Mm. Oh, how beautiful. So it started very young. So that's mm. when you decided, I mean, dedicating more time to being an artist, it sounds like that's the journey you started in the beginning and that's where you sort of ended up. What did you do after you got your qualifications? How did that transcend into, you know, an art life slash career? Mm. I did a lot of teaching when I was... Uh, relatively young I taught piano and then when I did my degree I then took a year off working as an etcher because my degree was majoring in etching because I love drawing and, and ink and black and white and then I decided that I did more and more teaching I was teaching a lot of adults I was still teaching piano I was teaching workshops and I thought actually I really love teaching so I then did a dip ed and then that led on to teaching in high schools so I went down to Melbourne and taught at Melbourne Grammar um, for a year, two and a half years, and then we moved back to Sydney with my husband and I taught at Barker. So I had five years teaching in schools and then took maternity leave. And that's when I, that was the end of teaching in schools. We then moved to America where I wasn't supposed to work. So I just started doing more drawing and painting, but not etching because watercolour was more friendly for children. And I started um, in, when we moved to Singapore, I started actually teaching adults from my home which I've been doing ever since. So the teaching has been a, um, a, a, something I really love, but I'm teaching adults more than, more than students, more than high school students now. And what type of teaching do you do, though, Jane? We know that you're a specialist, the specialist in watercolour and colour expert, but what do you mainly teach to others? I teach drawing and sketching from life, and I teach colour, colour understanding, colour mixing and working with watercolours. So I have various sorts of workshops and courses about sketching from life, working with pens and inks, working with pencils um, or working with watercolour or both. Uh, so there's obviously lots of crossovers. So, you know, some, some workshop, workshops will be really about just watercolour and how to use it and lots of special effects in watercolour. And some will be about um, sketching from life and then adding watercolour or adding watercolour and then sketching over the top and so on. So it's all that crossover. Sometimes they're purely about colour, um, generally watercolour, but I have taught workshops where people are using oils or acrylics as well. Um, but generally it's, it's that understanding of colour and how to use watercolour and how to draw preferably from life. Although, you know, sometimes you work in photos as well, which is fine. In regard to your own practice, do you have a studio? Are you... You know, where, you, where are you based? Where do you get your work done? I'm in my studio now. It's a very small space, but it's a very compact. And you can see there's just all sorts of stuff behind me. Um, I have a, I'm sitting at a, a lovely big um, architect's table. So I work with watercolour always on an angle. I have a computer over there. I have a view out the window and then I have loads of books. I can show you a little bit, but it's not exactly going to work very well. Um, and then we look out out the window which you won't see because of the light so I spent a lot of time and this is in <laughs> Sydney Australia for everyone Sydney now, Australia. what suburb are you in Jane Longerville okay lush trees lots of Beautiful gardens trees. and, yeah. Trees and mm. yeah yes 
Oh, and the river's just out there and I, I row on the river and, uh, and I, I love spending time just on the river and looking at the rocks and looking at the trees and just being out on the water um, and, and wandering around, you know, in the area. From what I know about you, Jane, is um, I'm very familiar that Jane gets up early in the morning before she teaches a class, yes. grabs a coffee at six o'clock in the morning and will take herself out to any location that she's on. And she does the most amazing uh, little travel diaries. Yeah. And, and, and I think that you really love that time, don't you, Jane, that, that early morning before anyone can get you. And, and that's a really attribute, a big attribute to your beautiful travel diaries. So you'll see her at some Fancy cafe in Bathurst, <laughs> the crack of dawn. Yeah, maybe early in the six, <laughs> There's quite a few of these people that do this, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, fortunately, otherwise it gets a bit lonely. But I think if I'm going to travel somewhere, I really want to have a record. And my sketching diaries are my own. They're, they're my playground, and I'll explore whatever I like. They're not necessarily shared on social minute media. They're certainly not for sale. And so I do different things depending on where I'm, what I'm looking at and what, what seems the appropriate way to approach it. So sometimes I'll be somewhere and I think, no, oh, that's a brown ink drawing with watercolour or it might be a grey ink or it might be a pencil or a water-soluble pencil, usually with watercolour but not always. And so I sort of, because I'm a realist, I tend to approach the subject to make it as, as realistic as possible but using the most appropriate medium. I mean, I love fountain pens. I love pencils. I love water-soluble pencils. I love watercolours. And they all get together so well that they can, whatever you, whichever order you, you use them, they have a nice little party. <laughs> and you do travel quite a lot around the world. You're part of the travel, have I got that right, the travel sketches for anyone? Urban, to... The urban sketches. The urban organization. sketches on Instagram. They are these group and you gather from all, well, we used to be able to gather from all around the world. Mm and travel and draw in locations. And with that, with your materials, then that there's quite a narrowed down uh, set that you use when you travel, isn't there? You're quite well known for your uh, customised colours. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Jane? Well, I'm always trying to work out how few you can get away with. And, and I love, I've always loved small things, uh, whether it's little tiny pencil sharpeners or, or little tiny staplers. And, you know, for as long as I can remember, if, if, if I had money to buy, it was on art supplies or stationery. And so I tend to narrow down to a, a palette with as few colours as is reasonable. Um, I then like to add some others for all the wonderful characteristics you can do with watercolour. So I may not, I may, I, may, I might have 20 colours, but it'll be in something very small like this. So this is just a very small... Um, brass palette that, that I would then travel with. Smaller ones too. I have smaller <laughs> ones too, yes. Uh, I have one that's a necklace. I have tiny little key rings. I have all sorts of ones that have you know, very few. little matchbox style. Love. Yes, I have a lot of fun with it. <laughs> and, uh, and I can get down to comfortably working with about nine or, or you know, three at a pinch. But I do a lot of work on, on how to figure out which three colours or four colours or six colours or nine colours would work the best for being able to be to, to do whatever you want to do with as few limitations as possible. So I don't want to create a palette that's only good for urban sketching or only good for um, botanicals or something like that. I like things to be, you know, so that you can use the one palette for anything. And I came up with one that that's, I called it the ultimate mixing palette. And I did a book explaining all the different mixes, you know, with, a hundred, with, with 15 colours, there were 105 two colour combinations. So I painted all those out. And then I explored some of the most important three color combinations. And the whole book just goes through thousands of combinations using these 15 colors. And that works for just about any subject you can come across. It doesn't mean that you can't add fun colors or convenience colors, but I was really looking at, you know, how, how few can you get away with and still be able to work on any subject. So that, that was then created by Daniel Smith. They made the palette. So there's 15 colors in, in a little um, plastic travel palette and, uh, and most of my teaching works with those colors but with additional ones if people want to so the idea isn't that people can't explore the, the lovely colors that they may want to add but that they can do everything they need to do with this with this um, palette of 15. Tell me, so I love those sorts of challenges. <laughs> I, I do know you love a challenge and your um, attention to detail is is absolutely brilliant do you have that same attention to detail when it comes to planning your practice or is it more spontaneous? No, that's more spontaneous. I'll, I'll generally um, choose what I want to do and just 
go for it. I don't necessarily do preliminary studies or sketches or tonal work or anything like that. Um, I will basically um, look at look at a subject, choose what I want to do, and I might think, right, I'm going to divide the page into nine and do a little bit here, or I might just line it up on the paper and start. Um, when I'm working on my own paintings, I tend to be much more uh, free about it, um, just instinctive. So I had a very funny story. I, I was... I'd been away and when I was at, at college and I, and I came back and I had a photo of some sunflowers that I wanted to do an etching. And my tutor, a lovely man, Earl Backham, very famous in his, in his time, and he saw me just about to draw straight onto this plate looking at the photo and he said, no, you can't do that. You've got to draw it out. And I had to, you know, put them back with, with chalk and then draw it through and everything hey. else. Yes. <laughs> and when I, when I did all that, he came over and the line I had started to draw was in exactly the right place. So he left me alone after that and just let me do whatever I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I don't do a whole lot of planning. Sometimes, but usually not. So I know the mediums and materials that you use, mainly watercolour. For anyone who's a colour lover like me, if you Google anything on colour, Jane is your girl. She knows everything, mm -hmm. can right down to the science and the chemistry of it, and it's, it's so fascinating. I know, Jane, that you told me that you want to test every watercolour yes. in the world and you've got these wonderful little videos of you unwrapping colours. I think it's just a way to buy art equipment, but can you tell us a bit <laughs> about your mediums and materials? So your watercolour is what I use mostly, um, and, and I work mostly with natural hair brushes. As far as the watercolour goes, I, I've been working with Daniel Smith as a brand for 25 years now. I started working with those when I was living in America, just two years after they came out, and I, I bought a little set that someone had put together and started working with them, and they were so beautiful to use. But that's what started me on this journey because they had these little numbers on the tube that I hadn't seen before, so the, the PV19 or whatever it was, they actually showed the pigment number. And that's this is really pre-internet. And they would also, uh, we would get catalogues sometimes and they'd talk about the importance of the pigments. And so it really got me interested. And I was looking at the other colours I had and I couldn't find out what was in them. Um, so it was looking at, at okay, this is, this is something important. And I started to really start to research it. And there were a couple of books available and you could start looking in encyclopedias. And eventually, you know, the World Wide Web started to open up. But because Daniel Smith had all that information on their tubes, I could start understanding how the colours were put together and which ones worked, and I'd start trying to compare that with other books or other people's work and so on and, and started to look for, look for the patterns and look for the problems because watercolours or any paint are not necessarily named for what the pigment is. Mm. They might be called Windsor Blue or Thalo Blue or blocks blue or some other thing and so unless you actually look at what's in them you don't know what you're buying which is a great way to sell lots of paint but it isn't necessarily that helpful if you actually want to um, be be sensible or, or buy across brands or or use a more limited palette or use colors that are going to harmonize with each other all those sorts of things so understanding those pigments is actually really really important and a lot of people just were totally unaware because you need your best glasses to be able to find them However, they are, um, they are one point. really important. <laughs> and they also help if you're working from different mediums. So if you work from oils or acrylics or, or watercolour or, or pastel, well, pastel is a bit more tricky because they don't necessarily tell you. But you can change mediums by looking not at the colour name so much as the pigment number and know that the permanent rose that you've got in acrylic is the same as the grown rose that you've got in watercolour is the same as you know, whatever else you might be using. So they're actually incredibly helpful but they were, they were kind of a secret up until more recently. Mm, that's fascinating. And I just want to know in terms of I'd like everybody to know, because it, you seem to be uh, quite prolific and you're always doing something. And I know that you work spontaneously in your own practice. But what happens when you hit, a, you know, a, a point where you, you just don't feel like you have your, you don't have the inclination or the inspiration or the motivation. Oh, you've lost your mojo. Yeah. What, like, what do you do? <laughs> Help us all out. <laughs> we can all um, relate. Is there something special that you do to, you know, um, become inspired? Well, that's, that's when I'll go to a sketchbook. So I might go back to something I hadn't finished. I try and work on location. I do a lot of urban sketching on location. But sometimes you don't get a chance to finish it. So sometimes I'll go back to 
um, as something I'd started and it wasn't quite finished. And, and then I would pull up the photo and have a look at the details and try and finish that and get a sense of completing something I'd started. Or I might um, pick up a shell or a something I have in my studio. I, I have these dead flowers up here. I, I kind of like dead Collector. things. And, uh, Yes, and or sometimes I'll I'll draw a brush, or I'll um or I'll pull out some some paints that I've been sent that need to be tested, and just start doing some swatches, or I'll you know work on something else that that needs to be done. I have a lot of online courses, and so there's always work to do. So there are there are times when I'm not necessarily doing something that's a new creative thing, but it's finishing something else off, and and then sometimes I just want to pull out some colours and play with them. So I might decide I'm just going to work completely abstract. I'm not known for abstract work, but I actually do quite a bit of it. And so I'll pull out just a few really lovely granulating watercolours and start throwing them around, sometimes with an idea in mind and sometimes not. So I might just tape up a whole lot of pieces of paper with a whole lot of um, squares. I like to work in a square on this sort of thing because then you can turn them around anyway and just start throwing some colour on and playing with it. Um, or I might go in the garden and, and pick a flower and, and do that or do a leaf. Um, well, a lot of the things I suggest to my students if they're a bit stuck is just paint a leaf a day because every leaf you pick up is a little bit different. I love and that, paint a leaf. sometimes it might be good to, to do it in pen, or sometimes in pencil or sometimes in, in watercolour and there'll be different colours and you might try putting the colour down and lifting it out or you might try painting around the veins. I mean, there's, there's, each one is just a bit different. Bit more tricky in the northern hemisphere where they have the, the leaves all disappear but in Australia you know we can always find leaves yeah. and they can be really really gorgeous to do and those students who've done that have pages and pages of leaves and that the improvement that they see in what they've done and the observation and the techniques is, is really dramatic but it's not too hard you know it's a small thing that they can work on mm. so I never find that there's not something to do or something that I can do it's more a case of there's so many other things I'm trying to do that I don't necessarily do the original work for myself. That's more of the problem. Mm. Um, and what's but, your stance yeah. on um, social media? How do you feel about it? How uh, often do you post? Um, what, what platforms do you use? Well, I have, a, I have a website and I have a blog and I use them quite specifically to share things I think people will find helpful. So the website is set up with all of the information on paints and on brushes, on sketchbooks, on papers, and, and all of the thousands of swatches that I've created. Um, they're all scanned and individually named so that you can click on each one to get all the details. Um, so the website is, it also has galleries of my own work and my sketches and so on. The blog is slightly different in that what I try and do there is to, to do a, a very specific post. So I might put the full range of the Shrinky watercolours or the full range of the Daniel Smith watercolours so that they can all be compared as a range. So that I work the two quite differently. Or if I'm looking at a whole lot of new fountain pens, I'll do a blog post on fountain pens. But they're generally intended as something that someone will find helpful. So it's the teaching part comes out. Yeah, very and just explain and, and, and help, you know, here's some information. And I try and cross-reference them, you know, where, where that's helpful. On Instagram, I'm, I'm probably most active. So that's where I'll, I'll tend to put up something. Perhaps if I'm doing those swatches, I might link them to back to the blog post I'm doing. Or if, I'm, if I've painted something on location, I'll put in a, um, an image of that sometimes. But I don't spend a lot of time on social media. I do have a, um, a Facebook page and I have a, a private, well, sort of a personal Facebook page. And I have a, a Facebook group for my students, but I don't, I don't do a, a lot on it. Um, I'm not very, um, I'm, I don't, you know, do that optimising everything and, and play all the games that you're supposed to play. But I put things up there when I feel like it. You so do it's have more, online class though, don't you, Jane? So people can come and, and do your classes online and that's grown over the last COVID year. Um, that, that you've spent a lot of time doing that. And so whilst you haven't been able to teach around the world, you, you, you are very accessible <laughs> in all the shapes and forms. So, yeah, Jane, so I have two big classes. Um, they're both 12 lessons plus a huge introduction. Um, one of them is called Mastering Watercolours and it really goes through from a, a serious beginner through to, you know, really understanding all the techniques and so on. And the other one's called Travel Sketching. 
And that takes people through many drawing tools and techniques, including techniques to draw from life. And that includes watercolour and so on as well. So they're both really, really big courses that are available for people to start whenever they want to. And they, I have hundreds of students working through them and they interact with each other as well, which is really, really nice. So they can support each other from different corners of the world. Mm. And, and there are question sections that I keep, I, I do check those regularly to make sure that I, I don't check every single post people put in, that's not possible. But, um, but I do go through very, very regularly and check the questions. So it does keep me busy. And if someone seems to be struggling with something and I think, oh, I could maybe add another video, video in there, you know, I can still adapt them and change them if I think it might be helpful. So it's, yeah, it's been, it's been very good. I'm very proud of them and I do intend to do some more, but um, they, they, they keep me busy. <laughs> so what is the thing then from all of those, you've probably got more than one thing that you recommend, you know, other people struggling to get more art in their life. It sounds like you just get on and do it. Yeah. Um, but is there anything in particular, maybe sort of slanted more towards watercolour, because I know watercolour for a lot of people could be quite scary. Mm. They feel like yeah. they need to know, uh, you know, all the technical. And I know when we look at Jane's work, she's very chemistry driven and all of that. And that sometimes can put people off. So what did you what do you suggest, Jane? Watercolour is deceptive because on the one hand, it is the simplest thing you can do. You just touch a damp brush into a a cake of watercolour and start painting with it. Just, so it is deceptively simple. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, the sorts of things that I encourage people to do are the things like do a, do a challenge, whether it's, you know, do a leaf a day or paint the things around the house that you love. You know, things you've bought tend to be things that, that resonate with you, whether it's painting your jewellery or or if you collect perfumes or you like a particular style of, of vase, there's, there's things that resonate and you just might like to pick up those things and start drawing them. Um, working in a sketchbook is really great because it's, it's, not as, it's not as scary in some ways and you don't have to show anyone if you don't want to. You can just turn the page. But I, I kind of set a bit of a challenge that whatever you do, you don't throw it away. Um, so I would always suggest work on good paper and, and then if you don't like it, keep working on it, whether that's putting gouache over the top or drawing back into it or, um, or washing it off and starting again, but sort of treat the paper as, as a bit precious, but not the image so that you then sometimes learn things you wouldn't otherwise. Whereas if you just screw it up and throw it away, you, you lose it and you don't get the chance to, to learn something new. We sometimes talk about there's a stage in watercolor where you've perhaps put down the drawing and you've, put in a couple of first washes, and it looks a little bit of a mess. Um, and we call that the, the, the nice brush stage because anyone coming up and having a look over your shoulder so looks for something desperately to say because the painting is nothing. And they'll be there, nice palette, and then off they go. And so you have to get past that. You've got to then, you sort of have to say, oh, come back in two hours or whatever. And so you've got to get past that. And I think a lot of people stop too early. They don't actually allow it to dry, start to build it up a little bit more, perhaps put another wash on or whatever. So, uh, so I think it's one thing is just don't throw things away, keep going with them. And another one is to, is to set small challenges. So it might be one day you think, right, I'm going to do a leaf. Another day it might be, right, I'm going to see what I can do with just three colours. Another day it might be something else where you're just giving yourself maybe 20 minutes or a little bit more if you can, but doing something and, and even put a whole lot on the one page and see how they relate together. Stones are fun, pebbles. Um, they don't have to be big things. And I think that's, that's what's helpful is just to do it. Mm -hmm. Make it resistance. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. And what are your plans this year in terms of your practice? I have done all the, um, all the images for another book. So I have two books currently available. One's called Watercolour Mixing Charts. And one's called The Ultimate Mixing Palette, A World of Colours, which is the one that has the 15 colour palette. So this is a, a continuation of that. So there's, uh, it's, work, it's, it's about triads. So I've created a whole series of triads and painted those out and shown the way that they then mix um, tertiary mixes as well. So the secondary mixes are in my other book and this is the tertiary mixes. So I want to actually finish that as a book, which I'll self-publish. And then I have two more courses that I want to write. So one of them is about special effects in watercolour. 
And one of them is a, a more detailed drawing. So it's, it's a drawing in detail, just going into the super fine detail using pens and pencils. So those two are, are those are the other plans. Um, as far as painting goes, I'm actually going to do a couple of mission works. And, um, and I have an idea of, of, a, of a series of paintings that I want to do that's something that's appealed to me for a really long time. I always like looking at the ground and seeing the patterns you see looking above. And I think now with all the, all the different, um, we, we're seeing a lot more images from above, you know, whether it's from satellites or whether it's from the, um, you know, all sorts of things. We're just seeing more images from above and you see a different view of the world. And so I'm interested in working in a square foot format and, and looking down at, um, at riverbeds or at rock beds or at, at beaches. And I, I just love that semi-abstract patterning. So that's something I'm, I'm being sort of had in the back of my mind and I take photos and, and it'll happen sometime. But I don't, I don't put too many deadlines on things because, you know, life happens. <laughs> it does. Indeed. So in terms of ex exhibitions, where can we come and find your work? Well, I'm having an exhibition at Gallery 1111 in October. Um, I exhibit with the Australian Watercolour Institute and in each of their exhibitions, and I exhibit online. I don't have any other things lined up at the moment, not being what I've been focusing on, but uh, I have plenty of work just waiting. <laughs> some waiting to be done, some waiting to be exhibited, but um, and lots still up in here. Yeah, and lots of amazing workshops as well. So if you've ever seen Jane... Um, the participants in a workshop quite often it's just this beautiful quiet and they're just so engaged in what they're doing and um and you're you are an amazing teacher jane um thank you. Artist. so thank you so much today yes for... yes we love jane color lover yes <laughs> <laughs> go and check her out we'll have lots of pictures and hopefully jane can supply us some images of those beautiful palettes we talked about maybe that's yeah. just me uh, and um, she's very attainable and, she, you know, there's so much you can learn from Jane everywhere, online and do a class. And we really appreciate your time, Jane, today. And we better let you get on with it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, you have lots to do. But look, you are very generous with um, all the information that you offer and you're constantly connecting people to art. So thank you from Art and Up. <laughs> and, thank you. Um, we'll, um, and we'll see you at the exhibition. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Happy painting. Bye. You too.